This is Jeff Richards. I'm a partner at GTV Capital. And I am panicked about my golf game as I come back from knee surgery five weeks ago. Jensen. Linzen. Burke. Linzen. Linzen. Holland. He just left. Holland Oates. No, I wasn't talking about Hans. We're just naming random 70s bands. You are in the right place for people who are already confused. This is <laughs> Panic with Friends, where me and my Norwegian pal, Canute, get together and we'll panic. What a year 2023 already is. And my life is, uh, you know, Canute, anything exciting going on for you? Not a ton right now, no, I can't say that. Yeah, so in my world, you know my world, right? Yes. Yeah, it's not fun. The fun world of Howard Lindzen. Howie the, Town. Uh, in Howie Town, things <laughs> are always sunny, but in Ventureland, whew, it, was a, it was the best of times, 2010, uh, the Uber days and the, the AWS days and the Apple App Store days and... Yeah. Ah, the cloud days, and now it's over, Canute. It's over. <laughs> and now it's just us telling old stories about that cloud. Remember that cloud? Remember there was a cloud? Yes. People put their stuff in the cloud. And then things got bubblicious towards, uh, we didn't die in COVID. Well, some people died, of course. Millions died. But you and I didn't, and that's mm. what matters. And Ethan was born. Ethan, what year were you born? <laughs> I was born in 2002. <laughs> 2002. Might as well be 2022. So you were you were gagged up and locked up, getting misinformation. You're all misinformed. Are you properly misinformed? Properly. Misinformed. Properly misinformed here in Arizona, and we came out of COVID. And God damn it, Canute, if we didn't just continue with uh, all the trends that happened, and to, so we had this. Why not have my friends on? Right. Panic with them, and we were right. You know, if if you're not dead, invest. And so one of my good friends, Jeff Richards, <laughs> became one of our most popular guests. Then I'd just stop calling him because it would just be, how much did we lose today? And so Jeff and I are very positive guys, Jeff Richards. He's been on the show. I don't know. What is he record? I think he's uh, four or five now. Yeah, so we've left him alone for a year because we're all just licking wounds and uh, repositioning for where the future is. And you know what? During this time of malaise, I just wanted to check back in with him. Jeff had knee surgery five weeks ago or something? Yeah. Yeah. Next is the hip. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, better his knees than mine. And we want to check in on that, see how he's doing. Um, they managed trillions of dollars, if not if not trillions, billions. Um, I think the last time we chatted, they closed on two and a half billion. So what do you do with two and a half billion and no one else? Uh, well, there's a lot of people writing checks, but where are, where is the growth? That's what the topic of today is. And I wanted to check in with my optimistic pal, Jeff Ritz. So are we ready to get him on the horn? Yes, we are. Jeff, you're on. Good afternoon, gentlemen. You may It may be a record uh, appearance, but I'm not sure. So um, is it? Well, I, you... I probably should just hold out. For, I should have held out for my next appearance when we're in the middle of another bull market. When, when would that be? Three to five years from now. Well, if you have some, <laughs> if you have some gold technology, maybe, and some uh, uh, oil futures. The um, you've been through this before. I'm this is the first time as I'm like I'm old enough to appreciate other assets, but I, my job is to invest in growth or the seedlings of growth, and it's kind of miserable out there. What what is it like? Well, I, man, that that's a good question. What is it like? I think I'm a professional podcaster. My job yeah. is to ask good questions. Finally, <laughs> you know, I I think for those of us who've been, I was a founder in the dot com bubble, so I started a company in 1997, rode through the up of the Nasdaq. You were a founder, I believe, at that time, mm -hmm. uh, and then the down, the brutal down. You know, the next few years were were pretty soul crushing. Sort of 2001 to 2000, I don't know, five. I'd say it was a pretty pretty mediocre time in Silicon Valley. And then we started to see things perk up again. And then out of that came Facebook and Square and Stripe and all these amazing companies. So if you've been through a few of those cycles, uh, which I have, because we then we also had the great financial crisis, 
you always sort of go into a cycle like this not knowing what the duration is, not knowing how painful it will be, but optimistic about what happens on the other side. And I find at least we're having a lot of those conversations. You know, we have a lot of founders who were in their early 30s, which means they were in high school yeah. in the great financial crisis uh, and and were, you know, getting a, uh, what is the McDonald's meal with the toy in it that, during the dot-com bubble. So this is really the first time they've been through a protracted downturn. And we're only in, what, month 12? Uh, Where do you count it as? 15? Yeah, it just feels like the duration. It's not possible that we could enter another bull market. I think it's going to take some time for this one to play out. I think inflation is a really difficult beast that most of us have never dealt with. Uh, I was a kid in the 70s, so I didn't really, you know, other than I remember waiting in line for gasoline, I certainly wasn't in the market at that point in time. But I think this is a difficult animal to tame. And, and even you see some of the smartest people in the world, you know, having a hard time with it. And so I think as a country, it's going to take some time to play out. And of course, everybody wants the quick V-shaped recovery we had in COVID where the market tanked in March. I think you and I were chatting. You could have thrown a dart at the wall in, in middle of March of 2020 and, and made Monday 90 days later. I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're in a quick recovery mode here. I think it's going to take time for this to work itself out and higher rates, you know, have a lot of impact on the mortgage market, the real estate market, certainly on the tech economy, you look at just where valuations have gone. We could talk a little bit about that, but it takes time to work itself out. And so I think one of the hardest things we've been working through is just the psychology of this of this moment in time with founders in particular who were raising capital in 20 and 21, when, as you know, people were just throwing money at anything that moved and was growing. That is not the case today. Uh, I, I would argue that the numbers that get published uh, you know, across various media sources are really inflated in terms of the actual funding that's going on. There is not a lot of new funding outside of some of the things that are happening in generative AI that, that's happening right now. It's a really challenging time for founders. So that's a good synopsis. You know, when 2000 bubble ended, it was all about the internet and eyeballs. And I can't remember, I wasn't in the tech as per se, as, as I was in just startups, because tech was expensive, right? Servers, et cetera. And then I forget what the trigger was, but it was obviously Web 2 and YouTube. Um, but some of the, the giants were starting to bottom and start going up. I mean, we just can't have 12 months. After that boom we had, it just, it's just not, I would say it just doesn't feel possible. And it feels like we dodged a bullet because generative AI, I mean, we don't, I'm not playing in that or investing in that space, just I don't have the skills, is a big idea, right? I mm -hmm. imagine you guys are. I, I think it's going to be huge. I think it's going to change the way kids learn. I think it's going to change the way software gets written. I think it's going to change the way a lot of us function in our daily lives. And it's, we have to remember, we're only a few months into this. I mean, the the technology has been a work in progress for years now, but really Correct. just hit the mainstream with ChatGPT in the last few months. I think it's going to be transformative. The the one thing that I think is really different about today, you know, if you wind back the clock to the dot com bubble, there were only a couple hundred million people on the internet worldwide. So we had a long ways to go to get sort of critical mass where people would actually spend money and adopt technology on the internet. And then in the great financial crisis coming out of that, you had the cloud and mobile intersection, which was just really incredible when you look back on it, all the companies that came out of that time period, not just Facebook, but companies like Stripe and Square and obviously accelerated companies like Amazon. Apple the, itself, one, yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say one of the challenges we have now is I think the distribution models are very constrained. Yeah. Apple, Google, Facebook, they control Microsoft. The pipes, the pipes they are control tight. it. Yeah. So, you know, when was the last great social network launch? When was the last great mobile app launched? I mean, you think about the things that we use today Snapchat, uh, you know, Twitter. I mean, these are 10, 15 year old platforms. There really hasn't been anything launched of consequence in the last couple of years. And I think that's largely due. It's just very hard to get distribution through those channels. And they're, they're, they have much more, much more of a constraint over the innovation economy, I think, than they did a decade ago. So that's something we also have to reckon with. I mean, I think that's the biggest one, right? Because uh -huh. you've trained kids to do a certain thing, go to engineering school, build an app. But as investors, we're like, don't bring us an app, <laughs> right? Like there's that misdirection. And I don't know how you repurpose these kids to actually what this generation needs to be as marketers, like jujitsu, 
you know, the four P's, not just, you got to be omni-channel skills at marketing. You can't just have a Facebook ad uh, strategy. Well, the one thing that I, and I, you know, I get a lot of kids that ping me from, you know, Dartmouth where I went to college and friends of my daughters and others that I talk to every week. And I, I think if, you know, if you could go back in time, go back to the 90s when, when the internet was really starting to take off with Yahoo and Netscape and Amazon, you would have just gone headlong into it. I mean, I did as a founder into a related space, which was telecom, but, you know, the, the networks that have come out of that, you know, there's obviously the PayPal mafia, you know, that come out of the diaspora. Look at all the amazing people that have come out of Yahoo and Google. I think the same thing is going to happen with generative AI. And so all these folks that I'm talking to are in college or coming out. I say, look, just embrace this technology, learn as much as you can about it, use it to do whatever you can to study, use it to write code, use it to create content. Because I think those folks are going to be in demand in some way. If history repeats itself, they will be in demand at some point in the next three to five years. The challenge is we just don't know how. Right, because it's only internet, four months old. Like, and everybody's yeah, chips and I think in with already. the internet, it was a little more obvious what was going to happen. Yeah. We didn't know what the time frame was. And I think with cloud, it was basically things that aren't in the cloud, moving to cloud, okay. Mobile, you saw a little bit of a, a big vector shift. But, you know, when we look back on it, it, um, it really was a new way to consume content and engage with people who are offering you products and services, you know, ordering from Amazon on the web is pretty similar to ordering on the Amazon app today. But things like Uber wouldn't have existed using a PC. I think with this, it's, we're just in the early days of even understanding what the implications of this are going to be. And I think it's going to be, it's going to be scary. You know, you've certainly read all the articles, people worried that it's going to take out a ton of jobs. But man, if you're young, if you're in your, you know, late teens or early twenties and you have time to embrace this stuff and learn it and work with it, I think there's going to be some amazing stuff that happens in the next few years. Yeah, so if you're not 18, Ethan, do you have the ChatGPT4 app on your phone? Yeah. Okay, so if you're not 18 and have playing with ChatGPT, because I'm like farting around with it as an old man, like tell me jokes in a different language or write me a speech in this, but you have to play with this because it's the first interesting thing in a while. Like crypto got everybody's attention because of the money flowing, but enough, mm -hmm. but no one ended up using it. I think also the ability to write code and create things that this is going to enable is a new vector. I mean, if you, if you were not really oriented towards math and writing code, your ability to create on the fly quickly and sort of rapidly launch, test, you know, iterate was somewhat constrained. Um, whereas I, I think we're going to enter into a mode where somebody with very little technical skills is going to be able to write code and build things uh, in, in, in very short order. And I think that should enable a whole wave of innovation. And we could see some amazing stuff coming out of, you know, young people who are still in college or just coming out of college. I'm certainly, my daughter's a freshman. I'm encouraging her to play with this technology because I, I just we could see a scenario where it evolves very rapidly and, you know, entirely new business models get created in a very short period of time because although the Apple, Google, Microsoft, you know, et cetera, control distribution, the dollars that are available to people who get things right are so much bigger than they were 10, 20 years ago. Well, right? That's a good start, point. The entire revenue, there was a great stat that I saw, the entire revenue of the, I think it was 450 internet companies that went public in 99 at 2000 was $15 billion. The combined revenue. That's less than Uber today. Wow. So the dollars that are available when you get things right, and I think the disposable income, particularly for that younger generation, you know, when I was in college, it was sort of assumed that you didn't have any money. You didn't spend any money. You had no disposable income. You might be lucky to have a credit card and your parents capped the spending at, you know, $100 or something. Whereas today, these kids have grown up with mobile phones. They've got, you know, Amazon on their on their phone, they, their parents give them some leeway to buy their things that they need to go through in their daily life. And so we're seeing, you know, for brands that get that demographic right, you can, you can generate a lot of, uh, a general, a lot, lot of revenue if you get it right. Look at, you know, look at Liquid Death, the, the water brand and how successful that's been. I think you're going to see a bunch more things like that that may be physical brands, but the way that they go to market and the way that they reach customers will happen faster because you can use AI to write the code, create the brand campaigns, test, hmm. you know, test various things. I, I think it's going to be really interesting, but it's, but it's unknown. I think this, the thing that is scary for so many people right now is it is a very different vector from what we've been doing over the last 13 years in technology. Hmm. 
No, and that's what's scary to me. You know, my son who who found golf, right? So he's not on the rails anywhere, right? And, and meaning he didn't, he wasn't a systems kid, and hated the system in many ways. The system spit him out. And then there's my daughter who followed the system and now is living the Zoom life in Manhattan. I'm like, get off the system, right? Like, go take a year <laughs> off, luckily, and like recalibrate, like just because you know if you're in that pre-2022 boom era, I think everybody's kind of mispositioned because they're playing with the wrong toys because distribution is held up by Apple and Google. Like if, if I'm going to go spend my money to rise in the app store, it's just not a good, it's not a good use of time when Apple can change their terms of use or their will at, at any time. Well, I also think the advice of taking a year off is good advice in general. You know, I, I, Spent a year after I graduated from college, I went and lived in Sun Valley, Idaho, and started a business delivering food from, or from the restaurants to tourists. It was a terrible business. This is way pre-internet. Right. But it was, you know, it was just a great way to get started, and, and I wish I had done it again. I, I think one of the other vectors that's going to happen in the universe is it's just, it's just, there's so much information, there's so much technology, the advancements are happening fast. I think adjusting to the world around you is going to be an important skill set and just, you know, travel a bit, get out, see what people do in other parts of the world. I mean, we're, you know, we're 300 million people out of seven point, what is 7.5 billion. Mm-hmm. And uh, I certainly hope my kids get the chance to to take some time before they really get, because, you know, once you're in your thirties and you're having kids and grinding at work, it's hard to take it. It'd be hard to take six months or a year off. I'm doing this thing where I go New York, Europe, Middle East, work my way around the world three-ish times a year now. Not everybody has that, but I have to get out. And I've been doing that for three, four years, just sensing that everything was just the same here. And it helped me recalibrate around sports, right? Like pickleball, like while we were looking for tech, pickleball (laughs) came out of nowhere, right? America has this, like, and no one wants to, you know, people are embracing and make fortunes are going to be made in just a sport. That has no tech. It's the dumbest thing ever. Like paddles, it's ping pong standing up. Well, it's, it's standing Howard, on a ping pong table. You'll be happy to know that pickleball was invented in Washington. I think it was a Bainbridge Island, Washington, in the seventies. I actually had a. Oh, I grew up with a pickleball court. So it's backyard. been around, just no one yeah. played. I think it was never considered as sexy or glamorous or as interesting as tennis, but it's a lot of fun. It's a fun sport to play because you can play it as you get older and. Hopefully not get hurt. Although I do think that's how I hurt my knee was playing pickleball. Oh, interesting. That's a different. That's a different story. <laughs> well, when you watch tennis, and I get a lot of clips now on Instagram. I, I mean, Instagram for me is just uh, seems like it goes from golf clips. I don't even play tennis, but you know, you clip on one great ten- this new talent in tennis, and it literally looks like ping pong. These guys are so good; it looks like so playing ping pong. Yeah, and so really it good. made sense that it's so unachievable that someone would have to reimagine. The game because when you watch the greats play tennis now it's like they're playing it's like a sport you can't even remember well they they're six foot eight and they hit 140 mile an hour serves i mean it's a different game but they're tracking everything down yeah. the angles are insane the attack mode is always on you know they've just perfected the speed i don't know so it's fascinating and the same thing i like i said i've been going down this par three rabbit hole because golf's the same thing once you put a driver in everybody's hand and it becomes you can't play college golf unless you hit it over 300 in the air you just cut out 99 percent of the population <laughs> over one feature remember canoe when we had drivers the big bertha it was just the beginning i know it really was like they were t- you know hitting a driver 220 with a ballad ball was insane <laughs> right like you were limited out on tech and then they unbundled the tech from the game and now so you have to reimagine the game the parameters of the game. So and there are, right? Isn't Tiger doing some sort of uh, Tiger's it's launching? It's too techy. I think this is the one, like... Isn't it, this thing like a par three with sort of the, some of the same features that oh, Top he, Golf has? Yes, yeah, so he's, he's, he's doing, doing something... He's doing putt stroke, which is actually a really good idea. Yeah. Because it's just reimagining Goonie Golf for kids. Yeah. Um, but you need a lot of capital to get into that. That's a real oh, he's estate He's got a play. lot of capital. <laughs> yeah, but... But for the people that don't have capital, golf will find a way, meaning, yeah. you know, no one has five hours. Uh, I haven't even talked you through the one that we're doing in, in part three golf. But 
a lot of stuff will get reimagined and tech will get infused. So I'm on this big idea that things should be tech infused. Is that something that GGV would do or you have to, because of the dollar amounts, you have to go full tech? We're pretty, you know, we're pretty focused on things that are pure software, pure technology, high margin, ideally high growth, you know, global. We love themes that are global. You know, and, and I'd say we're having been, we're, our firm is 23 years old. We were founded in 2000. And so we've invested in good markets and bad markets. And, you know, the, the Warren Buffett saying, uh, invest, be greedy when others are fearful. I mean, that is, that is the model. I think the challenge that we have right now and everybody has is just human nature. When the market is sort of in a little bit of a funk, it's hard to want to put capital to work. And what we have done over the last year and a half is really try to double down on the founders that we love, double down on the businesses that we love, offer capital to, more, to people who need more runway that have a really exciting company that, you know, may be seeing the same headwinds that everybody else is. And again, I'm having a lot of conversations. I just had one this morning with a CEO who was lamenting longer sales cycles, lower NDR. And I said, you're in traffic commenting on the traffic. I mean, everybody else is experiencing mm. the same thing you are right now. And that's a hard thing to get your head around when you're, you're used to winning, you're used to being successful, and you're just coming off of two or three years of sort of record growth where you really never saw any headwinds. And so I think the biggest challenge right now in software is everybody is feeling the headwinds of, you know, layoffs among big tech, so they don't need to buy a ton of new software for new hires because they're not hiring anybody. Um, it's hard. It's It's just a hard environment to get your head around. And I think the most important thing for folks that have been doing it for a while, they know that eventually it gets good again. But if this is your first cycle, it's hard. It's pretty unnerving. You don't know how long the, the snowstorm is going to last. So that's on the founder side, good stuff. On the VC side, tell tell people what's ahead for them when DPI starts to matter. And, and walk me through how you think about DPI versus IRR, like as a firm. What, what, what should both LPs think about and what are venture capitalists really supposed to think about? It's a great question, uh, and for those who don't know, IRR is the rate of return. It doesn't always mean liquid or capital being distributed. DPI is distributed capital back to LP. So if I give you a dollar and I return a, a dollar, that's a 1x DPI. We've always been, I always tell people, when I first started at GGV in 2008, one of our founding partners told me, my family can't eat IRR. <laughs> so, so we've always been a very DPI-focused firm, and I think you know, we made a commitment last year. We wanted to have as much DPI in 22 as we did in 21. And 21 was a, a 20 and 21, I believe we had 17 companies go public. So there was a lot of liquidity in the market. There were a lot of IPOs. Venture firms were, were returning uh, not only record amounts of capital back to LPs, but also showing really strong IRRs. And then, of course, when you have that many IPOs in a short window in time, one of the challenges is a lot of those shares are locked up. So when you take a company public, it, it's usually you're locked up for six months. And then even after that, if you think about the insiders in a company that, let's say a company has a $10 billion market cap, if the insiders own, I don't know, I'm guessing 60% of it, that's $6 billion that they're going to try and sort of meter out over the next two or three years. And if they sold it all at once, it would just crater the stock. It would no longer be a $10 billion company. So it's a very tricky process to manage well. And so you had a lot of that liquidity, hundreds of billions of dollars in liquidity that was created through those IPOs that was either locked up or newly public and very hard to sell. And then, of course, the market came down and we saw software go from 20x forward revenue to, you know, five or six where it is today. And so a lot of paper wealth and a lot of paper gains that could have been distributed back to LPs that went away. And it's obviously a very frustrating time in hindsight for everybody in our industry because everybody wishes they would have been more aggressive in selling and more aggressive with distributions but that would have had a that would have had a related impact which is it would have brought the stock prices down faster so it was a very tricky it was a very tricky environment i think everybody knew we were in a frothy environment i don't think folks in our industry you know collectively really understood maybe with a couple of exceptions how important the zero interest rate environment yeah. was we all underestimated that and then when you know, when it went away, it's it's obvious in hindsight. I mean, just look at the charts today of correlation between software valuations and interest rates, and there's a very clear correlation. So it's been it's been a challenging, I'd say, uh, eighteen months. Yeah. So I used to joke about it as I tweet as I was doing things, going, "Well, this is the me doing it is the top." 
right? And COVID, <laughs> COVID, you know, when we started this podcast and you were gracious to come on early, it just seemed obvious. The, the show's called Panic with Friends. So it seemed obvious. What seems obvious today? Is there anything that seems obvious, good and bad? Well, I think I'll give you one obvious one, which is just there was an entire category of fintech companies created around a zero interest rate environment. Hey, yeah. And when rates are at 4 or 5%, some of those business models just don't really make sense. And so what we don't know is, are we going to go back to a 2% rate environment? We're probably not going to go back to zero anytime soon. So I think there were some categories where, uh, you know, even in the real estate property, you know, prop tech became very popular. And there are some business models that are very, very, very heavily correlated interest rates. You know, you look at the, I still think we're in the early days of the correction in the residential real estate market because, you know, this regional banking, the challenges in regional banking coming out of the SCB collapse are just getting started. But but 60% of residential mortgages in the U.S. come from regional banks. Mm -hmm. 60%, 80% of commercial real estate loans. So we're still in the early days of maybe some tightening around those credit markets, and that could really wreak havoc with the, you know, the real estate markets, particularly markets where, in a lot of markets in California, for example, we have an extremely tight supply. It's very hard to build new homes or buildings in, in California. At least it has been historically. We'll see if that changes. And so that has always created this sort of constant march upwards in pricing. But in second home markets, if you potentially have the correlation between baby boomers aging out of those second homes and looking to sell them, mm -hmm. higher interest rates, higher costs to own, just, you know, matched with inflation and a and a more challenging economy, I think you could see some really challenging things in those markets. So if you, you know, you know, there were a ton of companies created around prop tech and a lot of them didn't realize it, but they were built around a very low interest rate environment. So fintech, prop tech, um, you know, software, I think anytime you have headcount reduction broadly, technology, you know, the, the main buyers of software tend to be technology companies, telecom, banking, the government. Anytime you have a reduction or a flattening of headcount in those industries, you're going to see a slowdown in software buying, and we're definitely seeing that. The one category that's been booming is travel. Yeah. And, I mean, um, look at me. I have three months a year on the yeah. road comfortably. <laughs> so that may be really the obvious one. I think mixed media, like seeing pickleball, but keep going travel. Keep going, and we'll come back to it. No, I think I just, I, I don't know where, you know, obviously Airbnb has been a massive success story. They did an incredible job. But let's not forget, during COVID, they almost died. Right. They did a billion-dollar loan to survive. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if there are some new companies that come out of the travel space. Clearly, that's where people want to allocate their dollars. Again, the problem with that space is one of the largest advertisers in the world, the largest advertiser on Google, is Booking.com. Hmm. I learned this through my investment in Hotel Tonight. Amazing company, Sam and Love. Uh, I'm booking Jared. it tonight. I'm using yeah, it they, today. Yeah, it's a I great application. But... You know, it got big enough to where Booking copied it, and it's tough to compete with a company spending billions of dollars a year on Google. So got it. that's the only challenge you have in travel is that the sort of internet arbitrage that was there 15 years ago isn't really there. Those guys can build and replicate innovative uh, new offerings. Yeah, but so travel at scale, you're not recommending, nor would I. I just think it's hard to get big. You know, yep. it's hard to compete with those guys. If you get to... 50 or 100 million of, of ARR. You're on their radar. Yeah, you're on their radar. They've got more resources and they actually have a very technology savvy organization that can compete. So it's hard. Yep. You know, what's obvious? It's, it's such a great question. What's obvious? I, 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 well, it's obvious what's bad. So you just pointed out like prop tech, fintech, you know. Well, they're bad right now, but they're bad for the companies that were built in a zero interest rate correct, environment. But correct. you and I both know there are going to be a whole bunch of companies that get correct. built in it's a. It's a reformatting exactly, of prop tech. It's a reboot. Fintech. It's, yeah, it's a, a reboot. reboot. Okay, so so you'll see companies that are built around this new interest rate environment. Interest rate. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, you know, we funded a company last year that is um, making it really easy to essentially use a credit card with a HELOC and sort of replacing high credit card interest rates. All, look at all the companies doing cash management now, offering, you know, I can get you, you know, my Wealthfront account now offers me $3 million FDIC insured because they put it across 12 banks. There's a whole new set of applications around treasury management for SMBs that's probably going right. to take hold because if people aren't going to feel like they, you know, beyond 250K, it's probably not safe. Yep. So there's a bunch of new things that are come out of this that we don't know about yet. And then I, I do think we underestimated the um, 
you know, the stimulus that we did, the $9 trillion, I think it was $9 trillion of stimulus that the government did, I, I still think that's making its way through the system. I and mean, people just lost their minds buying cars and boats and RVs. And, you know, obviously part of that is also being spent on travel. And so what's the other side of that? Is there a whole new, you know, used market that crops up for all those things that people bought and they can't afford two or three years later? I don't, I don't think we've fully seen that play out yet. Yeah. So again, so what's obvious is fintech prop tech don't go away. They have to get reimagined again for a higher interest rate environment. So it's a reset there. Travel, uh, agree, probably the biggest market in the world based on Google search, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. But if you poke your head up, you're going to get smacked by the big guys. So, you know, I have this thing, you know, back in 06, 07, it was too small to fail. And I think we're back there again mm -hmm. where kids need to be jujitsu. They got to have more than one skill. Chief of staff was like an overused term, uh, but a chief of staff, someone who can do a lot of things is important. Well, I'll tell you, I love that role because we're seeing a ton of companies that have hired people as a chief of staff and three or four months later, that person's running product or running yeah. finance or running, you know, corporate development. That's a great on-ramp to other roles. The other category that I should mention, Howard, is SMB. You know, we, in the last two years in, in our country, in 20 and 21 and 22, we had 10 million new business applications. It's a record. And so there potentially is this entirely new class of people who've decided that, you know, corporate America, big tech, whatever they were doing before isn't isn't for them. Part of this was created by work from home. Part of it was created by COVID and just sort of people realizing that they didn't love their job. But those 10 million new businesses that are going to be created, I think are going to change the landscape of the way things work in our country. And the tools for them to be successful are all there today. They weren't there a decade ago, right? Shopify, Square, Stripe, you know, Zendesk, all these tools that you need to run a small business. Those companies, they were still in their infancy 12, 13 years ago when cloud and mobile were just hitting. So I'm, I'm bullish and I'm optimistic that, you know, one of the sort of um, anthropology studies that somebody does in 10 or 20 years and looks back at what happened in America out of COVID you know, potentially is a rise of entrepreneurialism, a rise of small businesses, a rise of, you know, people sort of taking their careers into their own hands and, and just kind of going it, going it alone and turning it into something really cool. So I, I, you know, we funded a lot of the companies in that space. We've got vertical software companies. We've got Brightwheel and pre-K education. We've got Slice and Pizza. We've got Homebase and the restaurant and, and SMB space. So I'm, I'm optimistic there that, um, you know, we're going to see a, a, a renaissance of, of innovation, but you know, it's hard. Starting a business from scratch is hard. And so those 10 million people are all sort of running into the, what is it, the trough, you know, the, the peak of enthusiasm. And then you run into the trough of despair about 12 to 18 months after you start the business and you realize how hard it is. Yeah. So we'll see. No, really, really good feedback. Any with your kids, what's the feedback that you're like, have things changed for you? You have four kids? I have four kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what is the mood there? Do they know what's going on? They do. You know, I'd say um, it's funny. The age though, is what, 15 to 20? I've got, uh, I've got 19, 17, 15, and 12. Right. Um, my son, who's the youngest, loves... Who's talking to you the most? My freshman in college. Okay. Yeah, and my son. And the two yeah. in high school tend to kind of, you know, mom is definitely... They're scheming. Mom's they're, more important to that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. They're scheming. No, I think, they're, I think that there's a really interesting dynamic... Um, where like my son is super digitally native, plays Fortnite, you know, all the things he does, you know, and I think that's where you're going to see the first iteration of, you know, Zuck's sort of version of the metaverse. I don't think it's him wearing a headset, but it is him building his own things it, within, you know, the gaming environment that he's playing in. He's very native. Crypto was easy for him to understand because it felt very much like the other things he was already doing inside of the gaming environment. Mm -hmm. So I think you may see that generation grow up with this really interesting, and again, Back to our conversation about um, generative AI, you know, if he and people of his age can figure out how to use that and write code and build things, mm -hmm. they're going to be building their own games. And it's going to be, it's just going to be a really wild experience to, to watch it take off. And all the payment rails will be there and, you know, everything else. I'm sure Zuck Yeah, and it won't even cut. be in the media because <laughs> they, you won't even be able to cover it. No one will be able to understand the scale of these things. Exactly. Because they're going to be decentralized at, at certain exactly. areas where no one will know. Exactly. Yeah, that's super interesting. So I think that's an interesting area. And then I'd say that the, um, you know, I was, we were just on spring break and I happened to, I was with my kids and we were chatting with some kids that are graduating from college. It's a little bit of a scary environment for those folks. They're coming out into a, 
the first slowdown in the market that we've seen in a decade. And so they're nervous about what their job prospects look like. And I think we've got to, you know, I, I lived through that in the dot-com bubble. We lived through it in 08, 09, and just got to realize that that is going to be really challenging for a lot of folks. And the mental side of that is hard, right? If you're coming out of college, you don't know if you're going to have a job, you don't know where you're going to live. It's hard. They'll power through it like every other generation did. But I think you're going to see a lot of articles and stories written about how it's a really challenging time for, for kids to be coming out of college. And then, you know, hopefully a year or two from now, things will be a lot big tailwinds and a bunch of new industries will be cropping up. Yeah, I mean, the, the last one was about product, 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 because ship it because you could get it distributed for nothing. This, so it led to this boom in people going, you know, to work inside a fang company which was not a bad decision, but maybe in the end a big misdirection. This next generation feels like they should be seeing the world, uh, thinking smaller, but also have more, more multi-skills than just coding. Well, I think back to that idea of those 10 million bit new business applications. I, you know, when I was coming out of college, I was sort of at the tail end of the, oh, go take a job at IBM, go work for it wasn't called Accenture. It was Anderson Consulting at the time. You know, there was sort of this mantra of you went to work for Citigroup or I just don't, I don't see as much of that right now. I see kids, they've sort of grown up in this, a little bit of a different environment. They want to go, and I hope they do. I hope they start things. I hope they try new things. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that works out if we're in a down market for the next, you know, who knows, right? I mean, Powell could cut rates later this year, and all of a sudden we're in an up market in 2024. So I think it's always hard to, you know, I don't want to be bearish over the long run, and we're not bearish over the long run. We're, and we're, how do you think? How do? You, yeah, I know you're not bearish. So how no. do you think about size? What like if you were to if you're giving uh, advice to young investors and they wanted to? I mean, I've been telling kids for three years don't start a fund um, because DPI is going to matter. What you talked about, like. You're not going to go raise your second fund on IRR anymore. That that game is over. Well, a couple of things are happening in the market right now. We're seeing a lot of the early, the smaller, earlier stage funds that hold positions in some of these more valuable, you know, mid to late stage companies are now starting to sell those positions. So there's a pretty active secondary market, and we're seeing some of our larger LPs come in and be buyers of those shares, and huh. and you have some other funds that are buying those shares as well. So. You know, in any down market, you have people that need liquidity, whether it's in real estate or public equities or private. Um, so we're, we're definitely seeing that play out right now. I think one of the hardest parts, you know, we did not, at least on the software side, we did not make a lot of new investments last year because there was such a disconnect between the public market and the private market. It really didn't start to creep in. Reality didn't really start to sink in until Q4 and Q1 of this year. So it was actually hard to go buy you know, even if we wanted to buy secondary shares in a company that was that we're really excited about, you know, kind of an iconic company that might be worth a billion or two billion dollars, but the last round was at ten billion. We're just starting to see now those shares trade at at those lower uh, valuations. So it, it's just the private markets take a long time to follow the public, and I I think where you'll really see the reset happening, you saw. Um, you've seen a few high-profile companies that raise money at, at much lower valuations. I think Tonal was one that just did so. I think you're going to see a lot of that in Q2 and Q3 of this year, assuming we don't see some massive reversal from the Fed on rates. Um, I think you'll see valuations. You, know, you just can't pay 20x revenue for a company that, in it, when it goes public, is going to trade at 5x. It just doesn't. That model just doesn't work for very long. Well, and it did with zero percent. It did, and if you look at the chart, you know, I've got a chart in front of me from 2005 to 2017, so 12 years, the average software company traded at somewhere between one and a half and call it 6x forward revenue. Yeah. And then all of a sudden in 2020, it went to 20. Well, it wasn't all of a sudden. I talk about it here with, with WAG. It was SoftBank. It, was, it started happening in 16 yeah, yeah. The rise started in sixteen, and then it really took off in nineteen and twenty. And you're right; it was, it was the entrance of not just SoftBank, but a few other firms that were really willing to pay almost whatever price it took to to get into something that was hot. And what you've seen now is the the correlation as rates go up. The the orange line on the J P Morgan chart is software, and it's come down, and we're we're now at about six x forward revenue. 
The other part that's changing is the public markets are telling these companies, you've got to show us you can be profitable. You've got to get to a rule of 40. So not only do you have companies trading at a, a more reasonable and more like histor historical software multiples, but they're being asked to get more efficient, which is not easy. One of What's the rule of 40 again for people just tuning in? Rule of 40 is basically growth rate and profitability. So you can, you can either have a growth rate of, of, of 40% and 0% profitability or 20 and 20 or whatever mix you want. Got it. But it's just kind of a measure of like, is this company growing in an efficient and effective way? And one of the things we tell founders, you know, we have a lot of founders that are, at least were, burning a lot of cash to fund growth. It doesn't get easier to become more efficient when you get bigger, right? I think it does in some extent on the consumer side, mm -hmm. but on the enterprise software side, trying to retrain your go-to-market organization to suddenly be way more efficient on how they spend their capital to grow gets harder as you get bigger. Yeah. And the numbers get bigger, right? Growing 50% year on year, growing 50% from 2 million to 3 million, not that hard. Growing 50% from 500 to 750 million, really hard. Yeah. And so maintaining those growth rates while also doing it in an efficient way is, is hard at scale. And you're seeing that work itself way through, work itself through the public markets. And it's one of the reasons why you see companies like Viva, which, you know, Peter Gaster, one of the great founders of our time, vertical software in the pharmaceutical industry, he only raised $8 million before the company went public. Oh, my God. Not so that 80, was like the Salesforce of healthcare. Exactly. Well, they were built on Salesforce. Built on Salesforce and, you know, but only raised $8 million. And today that is a $28 billion software company. And, it's, and it was profitable when it went public. Founded in 2007. So we're not talking about like the covered wagon days of software, you know. And so I, I always, I'm always fascinated when I read about these companies raising 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars, you know, series A's and, and seed rounds. Cause it's like, guys, that here's one of the most valuable software companies. That, and that was not the playbook that he followed. So why not try to follow a playbook that has worked and built one of the iconic software companies of our generation? You could argue that he had some real advantages cause he was built on, on the Salesforce platform, but you know, there's a middle ground between raising a billion before you go public and raising eight million. And I think what you're going to see, you know, the bull case and the optimistic case that we've been sharing with our LPs, because if you think about our firm, 75% of what we do is Series A and Series B. So, yes, we're certainly feeling the negative impact on some of our later stage billion dollar plus private companies, but we're incredibly optimistic about all the Series A and B companies that we're funding in 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 that now see the playbook from the public market and are getting more efficient. They're growing at, you know, more like a one or one and a half X burn ratio. Burn ratio being how, how much capital do I need to burn in order mm -hmm. to add a similar amount of new, net new revenue. So I think you're going to see better run, leaner companies that require less capital, which is also, by the way, good for the founders. They're going to own more of these companies. And they're going to go public in 25, 26, 27. So hopefully more, yeah. more Vivas. Well, what happened was, and I, I remember being there when I interviewed, when, when Instagram was like, what, 10 people and sold for a billion, WhatsApp <laughs> was 40 people sold for 19 billion. And I think what happened, maybe because of ZERP, was that instead of people, they were the role models, but the message got lost. So everybody in trying to be the next Instagram staffed up with engineers and it became like war and Airbnb and Uber were the two exceptions where war mad like in and, and obviously they made the mistakes where you had to scale up but everyone else didn't and so i think you have a 10-year misdirection there where everybody goes back to being thinking like instagram and whatsapp did and build a real business with that mindset and you know then softbank came in and it took five extra years for everybody to realize that was the top i think uh, I, I th I, you had a couple of factors one you had some heavy infrastructure type businesses. I mean, the, the one a few that you mentioned, the DoorDashes, the Ubers that required a lot of, you know, obviously yeah. WeWork required a lot of capital and then wasn't worth nearly as much as the capital that went into it. So there was this illusion that you needed a lot of capital to build Correct. these types of companies. So that's one part of the puzzle. A second part that I think people just sort of lost their minds over was a lot of those rounds with companies that raised two, three, four, five hundred million dollars, there were hundred plus million dollar secondaries for the founding team. So there are some companies that were valued at two, three, four billion in 21 and 22, where the founders, you know, took a hundred million off the table. Yeah. And in hindsight, um, I don't blame them for doing so because it was available to them and 
you know, they, they, no, they did fed it. themselves at the trough. I mean, they, they fed them... at the trough and it's money that didn't go to the balance sheet that you could have argued would have been better off spent trying to grow the company. But I, I, you know, one of the things I saw firsthand with a few companies was the tendency among founders also was when you raise that money, the tendency is to spend it. Yeah. And so people sort of lost perspective on is our capital being spent wisely? And it was more, well, we raised a hundred, we better go spend a hundred. Then we got to raise another 118 months from now. I just think that's gone. I mean, first of all, it's not available. The money's not there. SoftBank's out of the market. But I think founders realize, gosh, I don't really want to go raise a billion dollars and own 6% of my company. I'd rather, you know, do the Peter Gaster thing and raise 50 million and own 25% of my company and go public seven or eight, nine, 10 years later. So the pendulum has switched. It sounds like GGV is, again, well-positioned, but it's painful, this transition, because we just onboarded all these, I guess, people that just are playing a game that's already outdated, and they got to be retrained, reprogrammed. Well, we, we make a lot of mistakes, as everybody does, so I don't yeah. want to pretend like we read the tea leaves and, and are perfectly no, no, positioned. No, no, we, we, we definitely we all make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. I think, though, the, the I guess the positive... One big difference that I saw in the last 12 months versus the 0809 crash. In 0809, it was sort of the standard assumption was that if you had 12 months of cash runway, you were in a good position. Yeah. And the flip side of those aggressive valuations in 21 and 22 was we did have founders that raised quite a bit of capital. And so if you were smart about it and banked that money and didn't spend it, you're now sitting there today with two or three years of, of cash runway. And well, that's a pretty good position to be in. And then I even have companies that have gotten profitable. I mean, you, Slice, which is a, a company I'm on the board of in New York, north of a hundred million run rate. And the company in January of uh, 22 said, you know what, we should get profitable. And they did. By July, they were profitable. So they're generating cash. Cash runway is not even a part of the question. And, you know, they're just focused on building a, a great business. And I know there's some other private companies that are in that same mode as well. So my guess is when the IPO market comes back, those will be the companies that will be going public. They don't need more capital. Investors want to be part of these companies that are growing at 30, 40% a year and are, have already proved they can be profitable. So I'm, I'm optimistic that there'll be a few companies that crack the IPO window next, this year and in 24, we'll see, we'll see more liquidity. Yeah, that's where I'm watching. Now it has to swing back. We won't know that we're out of this until the IPO market opens. And then on the other end, we've got to get some smarter corp dev people into these companies that have cash and maybe slow in growth. That, that skill has been lost. You know, when I came up through the ranks, man, every corp dev team was an animal. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's now neglected at all these startups. Like they don't even know, they don't have that muscle. That's true. And they're scared. Yeah, that's true. And I think, you know, it is interesting though, in the context of that, to see Microsoft, what they did with OpenAI. I mean, Satya Nadella is just a ninja. Um, yeah, they killed it. And even, you know, what Shantanu was trying to do with Figma, we'll see whether that deal gets done or not. But I think you are seeing the the really well-run companies are willing to make some big bets. But in general, you know, the M&A environment that you and I grew up in where you would see companies exit for 100 or 200 million just really hasn't been there for the last few years. Yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether, just given how fast things are moving with AI, whether, you know, whether that drives a, a little bit more corporate development activity at the kind of sub a billion dollar level. Because, you know, back in the day, that was what drove a lot of the returns for venture capital. We need that. Yeah, you and need we just that. need it for yeah. a healthy economy. You know, everybody can't start a fund, but we need more corp dev. Everybody went into starting a fund and forgot about actual business skills. And corp dev is a, is an important American thing, right? Good deal, bad deal, like just like good investing, bad investing. We need corp dev. Like we need companies thinking and being shown ideas. So everything was off balance and everybody started their own fund. So, so I think those are things that I'm watching for to see smart people in corp dev and smart deals starting to happen and then see the IPO market open. That's what I'm waiting for. By the way, one of the, one of the, we didn't talk about, but one of the areas that I'm really intrigued about generative AI is what does it do in the financial markets? What does it do for, I, I, I don't know the answer to this. I don't even have a thesis on it, but I believe because, you know, Technology tends to find its way to the areas where there's the biggest return opportunity. I have to believe there are some very smart people working on some incredible tools with AI. Um, yeah, yeah, now that everybody's connected, I still think that's why Musk will figure it out, even if it's a smaller Twitter, just in that they can move markets. So, yeah, markets drive everything, 
AI will drive healthcare markets, education. Those are the three neglected things. You know, crypto was supposed to fix all that, but really that was just a money rush. Uh, and we need some more. I, I don't know what it is. I haven't fully been in crypto, but uh, AI, you can see Bloomberg. You know, Bloomberg's been quiet for whatever. They haven't, they haven't adopted anything in 20 years, and all of a sudden they've got their GPT. They've already got their AI paper out. So, yes, AI is real for finance. Well, the pace for the bigger players, I mean, Adobe's already launching products incorporating ChatGPT. I mean, the yep. pace of adoption of this technology has to be the fastest pace of adoption of any technology in history. Yeah. So super bullish around what it means to finance just seeing Bloomberg act, whereas they didn't act. They weren't ever scared of Twitter. They weren't ever scared of YouTube. They weren't ever scared of Robin Hood. There's been no innovation that even made Bloomberg wake up. But then AI, boom, they're spending mm -hmm. a lot of time there. They're releasing papers. Uh, makes sense. You know, that'll speed things up. And it's, it's the true innovation. I would hope healthcare, but that's regulation. So, so, so reg tech is going to be huge around fintech and healthcare. And then obviously education. Like you said, kids are just going to do it themselves. If the teachers, teachers have been left behind financially and just scope of work, but this is going to just exponentially kill, you know, old systems. Well, healthcare is one to be optimistic about. I mean, if we could yeah. provide faster, easier, better access to healthcare for a broader set of the population, that would be an amazing thing, right? And yeah, this we're an investor. Does. We're an investor, like in like a snowflake in this space, which is one up healthcare, and it's just you know they're doing what Snowflake did, but with medical. Uh, with all the insurance companies, uh -huh. so it's like they're, they're doing the hard work of getting all those companies on board, and then the, the the size of accounts explodes. So there is hope, but that's that regulation and just well, just look at how look at how inefficient the billing and payment process is in healthcare, and how yeah. much of the time and money goes into that in that industry. I mean, it's what what is it um, a third of U.S. GDP or thirteen percent? Some huge percentage of U.S. GDP is healthcare. And so when you talk to doctors or people that run hospitals, so much of it is billing, payments, invoicing, the regulatory process. And so if these LLMs could get trained to help solve some of that, oof, that would be amazing. Yep. So there is optimism. We'll end there. Thanks for doing <laughs> this, my man. Uh, I'm glad you're doing well. And the knee surgery, how hard was it? Oh, it was fine. I had, a t I had my net left knee done about 10 years ago, and I just had my right knee done, torn meniscus, partially from playing basketball, you know, for 20 years. But like partially from just trying to be a little too active as I get older. But uh, I have not played golf since the fall, and I'm going to hopefully get out sometime in April as we finally get sun here in California. What I've learned about golf, especially as we get older, and we saw Kupka say that like he just couldn't play because he was injured, you can't enjoy golf. if even It's like baseball players. You, if the smallest injury, and you're fucked because you, you have to adjust, and then your whole swing gets fucked. So it's unfortunate, like I'm learning that if you have an injury, golf is not a great sport. All right. Great to see you. I'm glad GGV's doing well. Thanks for taking the time to kind of help us level set here. Always fun to catch up. I hope to get out and play with you at some point. You got it. We'll see you this summer. All right. Thanks, Howard. Canute! Yes, Howard. Ethan, you're a fan of Jeff Richards, a young guy. I am. He I found out about him. He waxes poetic pretty well. Yeah. Smooth thinking. There's a, it was a huge change for us, you know, to put all that money to work. And, you know, he was right about SMBs, but, man, the valuations get everybody. Right. There's just no way out with that much money in the end. I know. You were right being conservative. For it being conservative, but you still, there's no, there's no not losing money. Yeah. You know, when everybody uh, needs liquidity at the same time, just pent up uh, rush to the exits, and this is where we're at. So, anyways, thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, that was Jeff Richards at uh, multi-billion dollar, 23-year-old uh, VC firm GG Ventures in the Valley and China and other places around the, the U.S. Um, we uh, at Panic with Friends uh, talked to people like Jeff, uh, founders, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, traders, investors to uh, try and uh, figure out where the markets are going and get a little bit ahead of some trends. Uh, you can find, uh, search my name, Howard Linson, go to Spotify, Apple, just search on Google, YouTube, and you will see Panic with Friends. Subscribe any of those places, and you will get in the form you like and the platform you like our podcast every Thursday. So uh, tell your friends, uh, hit subscribe, and we'll see everybody next week. Howard. 
Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or StockTwits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast.